From Hollywood, the CBS Radio Workshop. Yes, clerk. Journal American 411, right away. Good afternoon, Arthur. Oh, hello, Mr. Shelby. Any messages for me? Well, not since I came on, sir. May I have my key, please? I'm sorry, Mr. Shelby, but the manager says not to give you your key until your bill's paid. Oh? It's 113 bucks and some odd cents. I know. You want I should call him so you can talk to him about it? No, never mind. Sorry, Mr. Shelby. It's not your fault, Arthur. I'll stop back in a couple of days to see if there's any mail. Yes, sir. Yes, please. No, I'm sorry, Mrs. Murphy. Fourteen dollars and sixty, sixty-five, sixty-six cents. Well, I can eat for a week or so, and plenty of people sleep in the subway. CBS Radio presents the CBS Radio Workshop, dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. Tonight, subways are for sleeping, based upon the Harper's Magazine article by Edmund G. Love, a true story of one man's strange adjustment to mid-century materialism in the largest city in the world. Have you ever gotten fed up with rent, and taxes, and bills, and the clatter of telephones? With all the demands, large and small, that our complicated civilization makes upon us. Henry Shelby finally did. When they locked him out of his hotel room, he stayed out. For the past three years, he has, by choice, been homeless and without a steady job. Yet, Henry Shelby is no bum. He is as well-dressed and as smoothly shaven as the next man you'll meet. He's not stupid. He holds a master's degree in economics and is a former school teacher. He has never visited a soup kitchen or stood in a bread line or asked for a night's lodging at a Bowery mission. Still, he has learned for himself how to maintain his sanity and peace of mind in a confused and confusing society which takes from a man more than it gives. Henry Shelby has reversed the process. And this is how he does it. I'm getting along all right. I'm perfectly happy. I'm just waiting to see how things come out. In the meantime, I see to it that I always have at least 15 cents, so I'm sure of a place to sleep. And the truest statement I ever heard is that no one will ever starve to death in the United States. Eighty-six in the bean soup... All out of Yankee bean, Mac. Cream of tomatoes, okay. Tomato or both? Well, as I live and hope to, Shelby. Hello, Ernie. So you've got the counterman wanted sign on the window. Yeah, guy was here two weeks. Today never shows. Want to go to work right now? Sure. Well, go on back and grab a hat and jacket. I ain't even checked cash from breakfast yet. Okay, fine. Want a cup of coffee or something first? Go right ahead. No, I'm fine. Here's your soup, Mac. Crackers or bread? Crackers. Hey, ain't you the regular counterman? Me? I'm supposed to manage a joint. You give any bum comes along a job? Shelby ain't no bum, Mac. He's a college graduate. Huh. Michigan or someplace like that. Used to be a school teacher, too. So? Well, he shows up every three, four months, works a couple of days for five bucks a day in his meals, and then he's gone. When he tells me he ain't coming back. So that makes him he ain't a bum. Well, it does in my book. He can do anything around the joint. Do it plenty good, too. How's the soup? All right. Anything else? Uh, I don't know yet. This jacket isn't exactly the best fit in the world. (laughs) You look great, Shelby. I'll bet. Now, uh, here's your checks and the punch. Everything's the same as last time he was here. Uh, Not quite. Corned beef and beans are up a nickel. (laughs) Hey, they are at that. I forgot. Well, she's all yours. I'll uh, check the register. Anything else for you, sir? Pie? Coffee? I might have some pie at that, um... Apple. Right. Uh, with cheese, I guess. Right. Empty the mouse trap on this pie. Hey, uh, look, Shelby, I was thinking, I, uh, I got no night chef for the moment either. 
Well, why don't you stick around for a couple of weeks and help me out? Well... Eight-hour shift, five days, 55 bucks, and all the food you can steal. Here you are, sir. Well, I'll think about it, Ernie. I actually didn't have to think about it. When I went in, I knew I'd only stay for a few days. I have five or six places like that. They're my social security. I use them when my cash is way down and my suit needs dry cleaning. And when I'm ready for a good, long sleep, lying down. So, Henry Shelby works just long enough to get a little money ahead. Then he picks up his clean laundry and checks in at a respectable but inexpensive hotel. Here's the 450 in advance. I'm afraid I don't have any luggage. And will you send the valet up to my room in a few minutes, please? Once his suit is on its way to the cleaners, Shelby spends the next 24 hours in bed or under the shower. He has taken as many as 15 showers on one of these occasions and slept for as long as 22 hours. It's an extravagance, of course. Cost me seven or eight dollars, and that's as much as I usually spend in a whole week. But I certainly do feel fine when I check out. And thus refreshed, Henry Shelby sets out again to roam the streets of New York. First stop, to leave his laundry somewhere in the Grand Central area. He owns two of everything except for his one suit. And he'll pick up this bundle in a few days. Bathe and change in a booth at Grand Central Terminal and drop the soiled clothing off at another laundry in the vicinity. I carry a safety razor in my pocket and I shave at least every 36 hours. It costs 25 cents for a booth, but I can freshen up generally at the same time. The bums who look like bums are mainly the ones the cops bother. Naturally, I don't consider myself a bum, so I make it a point not to look or feel like one. Twenty-four hours can be a long time, particularly when all you have to look forward to is twenty-four more of the same. But Henry Shelby fills them with endless variations of the same pattern, and he walks between whatever geographical points are involved. Breakfast time may find him at a juice bar on 3rd Avenue. Large tomato juice, please. Come on there, friend. Fill it up. Your sign says 12 full ounces for a dime. Coffee at the automat on 6th. Another cup later in the gloomy fluorescent glare of a cafeteria in the garment district. I load in all the cream and sugar the mug will hold. They're calories. Free calories. Lunch in the Gramercy Park neighborhood today. Yesterday, it may have been at Broadway and 116th, but at the same kind of a white tile stand and very likely the same lunch. A frankfurter, I guess, and a large glass of milk. Two or three more cups of calories during the afternoon, and finally, the one substantial meal of the day. The Vienna loaf dinner looks all right. Vienna loaf coming up. Uh, not that slice. The next one with the hard-boiled egg in it. Yes, that one. Fried or boiled potatoes, corn or stewed tomatoes. Uh, no potatoes. Plenty of starch in the bread. Uh, how about a good helping of cream spinach instead? Mac, if you got an order a la carte, why don't you go to the Waldorf for the 21, huh? <laughs> well, I'll take you to either one of them someday as my guest. Yeah, I'll hold my breath. Okay, spinach. Now, nah. corn or stewed tomatoes? It's stewed tomatoes. Uh, what's that you're putting on? Gelatin salad comes with it. Uh, no, thanks. Let's trade for a dab of those cooked carrots, okay? Now, look, They're Frank. probably cheaper than the salad. You're saving money for the management. That's what I'm interested in. Okay, but don't ask me for no Charlotte rules. There you are, Mac. Very good. Very well-balanced dinner. Yeah, not bad for 42 cents. Not bad at all. I may continue to give you my patronage when I'm in the neighborhood. Thus, the inner man is stoked 
though perhaps not aesthetically satisfied, and always a walk between each refueling stop. The aesthetic hunger is assuaged along the way. There is the ever-changing kaleidoscope of Manhattan's store windows, displaying their shiny wonders, their sturdy commonplaces, their exotic luxuries, their mundane necessities. There is a record of mankind's daily activities the world over, in a newspaper plucked from a trash basket, and there are benches and parks and public buildings where Henry Shelby may rest while he reads. There are pillared halls where paintings and sculpture may be viewed. Henry Shelby is a regular visitor to New York's many art galleries, but his favorite is the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Now, if you'll follow me, we will view the museum's unrivaled collection of the works of Edward Degas. Edgar Degas. Edgar Hilaire Germain Degas. Oh? Oh, I'm sorry, madam. Oh, don't apologize, young man. That's very interesting. Degas worked chiefly in oil, although his renderings in pastel have achieved some fame. He wasn't a bad sculptor, either. Is that so? The oil to the immediate right and above is at the milliner's. And to the right of that and below is dancers practicing at the bar. Only the first now one is a pastel, along, not an oil. This guide is new, I'd imagine. Uh, let's stay behind, Myrtle. This gentleman knows more about it than the guide does. Uh, uh, you don't mind, do you, mister? No, not at all. They sort of hurry you through on the guided tours. Uh, now, uh, what about the one that's a pastel instead of an oil? Well, Degas' pastels, particularly his later ones, do have a deep, rich, almost oil-like texture. He applied the color in successive layers, fixing each tone or shade separately and using open lines to allow each undercoat to show through. Oh, well, I, I don't quite understand, but I, I see what you mean. Uh, are you an artist? No, although I'm planning to do some painting... Uh, sometime. Oh, well, my daughter's very artistic, back in Chillicothe. Um, what's this one, that lady sitting with a big bouquet? That's an oil. It's called Woman with Chrysanthemums. Well, <laughs> that's a good name for it, isn't it? Yes, isn't it? <laughs> Say, if you aren't an artist, how do you know all these things? Oh, I spend a lot of time here, and I read a great deal. Oh, you certainly must. Goodness, you're a regular Billy Pearson. I beg your pardon? You know, the jockey on television. Oh, yes. I've read about him. Didn't he win $64,000 and then go on and tie with a fellow named Price for another 64 or something? Yeah, that's the one. Did you ever watch those programs? No, I can't say that I do. I'm afraid I don't have a television set. Yes, there's plenty of free culture and free entertainment to be found in New York City. Even without a television set or a radio in your home even without a home. One of the most spectacular free entertainments in Manhattan is presented by the fire department. Henry Shelby always follows a fire engine. He generally gets to the fire, too. For the radius in which each engine company operates is small enough to permit even a pedestrian to arrive shortly after the equipment. Oh, this one is nothing. It's just a chemical job. They might as well have left the ladder truck back at the station. Now, you should have been at Amsterdam on 133rd the other day. I happen to be in the neighborhood at the time. There are the inevitable New York traffic accidents. Shelby has a nose for these and for straight fights, and he never leaves the scene until the last policeman has closed his notebook. And the parks and public squares are places where a man with a message may speak it forth within certain limits of subject matter. ...can commit mass suicide, and that is to continue to eat the flesh of the animal. What mother nature intended us to nourish ourselves with grows in the ground? Henry or Shelby stops to listen to every street corner orator he runs across, and what weighing gravely the ideas he hears. I can scarcely agree, but he does have a wonderfully resonant voice. There are the new buildings that constantly alter New York's skyline. Our well-kempt vagrant knows every major construction project in town and shows up at the exact moment some critical problem is to be solved. No, 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 a little more to the right. Say, does it look to you as if they're placing that girder properly? It doesn't right now. 
But they'll raise it another three feet and then force it to the right with a cross member. Oh, yes, yes, I see. Actually, it's a different technique than we're accustomed to watching in the usual steel skeleton construction. Uh, seems to me there'll be too much strain on the cross member. No, I understand the alloy is both light enough and strong enough so that, in effect, they're employing a variant of the ancient Egyptian post and little method. Say, there are similarities, aren't there? You're an engineer, I take it. No, matter of fact, my master's was in economics. Is that so? I'm liberal arts myself, Yale 28. Instruction's sort of hobby of mine. <laughs> Watching it at any rate. Mine too. So much so that I've done quite a bit of reading on it. Uh, there. You see what they're doing now? That's how they equalize the stresses. So they do. Uh, your office in the neighborhood? No, it isn't. I just happen to be passing this way. Uh, mine's just across the street, 230 Park. I'm H.J. Chisholm, Regal Paper Company. How do you do, sir? I'm Henry Shelby. Hello. You with the firm, or are you in business for yourself? Neither. I don't have a connection right now. Is that a fact? Well, if you're looking, why don't you stop by the office whenever it suits you? We might very well have something for a chap like you. That's mighty nice of you, Mr. Chisholm. I'm not really looking at present, but I'll certainly remember you when I am. I wish you would. Say, wouldn't it save time and an extra piece of heavy equipment to haul those I-beams up on the construction elevator and then place them with one of those small hoists? It seems that it would at that. I think you have something there, Mr. Chisholm. And I'm going to look into it the next time I'm at the library. The Public Library. One of Henry Selby's favorite haunts. A fellow vagrant once advised him that the library was a good place to keep warm on a cold day. But he found it to be much more than that. On his first visit to the massive old building at 42nd and 5th Avenue, he asked for a copy of the New York Times for November 10th, 1936, and was referred politely to the microfilm room. Here you are, sir. Are you familiar with the operation of the viewing machine? Uh, not particularly. I'll be happy to show you. The entire edition is on this roll of film. You place it in the machine, attach the end, and thread it this way. Close the machine and turn the handle forward. Yes, it's fine. You sit right down here, use the headrest, and view the film through the aperture. Yes, I see. Very clear. And very comfortable. Yes, isn't it? It rather makes research a pleasure, doesn't it? I should say so. Uh, what if I fall asleep? <laughs> well, I'm afraid no one would awaken you if you did. There seem to be so few of you scholars taking advantage of our microfilm facilities. Just come to the desk if you wish additional rolls. Say, how long has this been going on? Henry Shelby was asleep in 15 minutes and awoke undisturbed five hours later. For some time, the microfilm room was at the top of his list as a place of shelter. Then suddenly he realized it was a far more valuable place for pure entertainment. He has read all the issues of the Times available on film, all his favorite comic strips from the date of their inception, all the columns Damon Runyon ever wrote, and has even developed a system for playing the horses. One time, he worked long enough to accumulate $25 and with it, visited Aqueduct Racetrack. Now entering the winner's circle is Time You Told Me, ridden by jockey Farrell Zufel. The time for the mile and a 16th was 1.43 and 2. And the result of the eighth race is now official. 11.20 to win. Let's see, that makes me $87.40 ahead for the day after expenses. <laughs> well... How long has this been going on? Very prudently, Henry Shelby bought himself a new suit of clothes, leaving his original $25 untouched. A few days later, he visited Belmont Park and lost the entire sum. I still play the races in the microfilm room. During the winter, I study the preceding summer's entries, make my selections, and check them against the results in the following day's paper. I never look at the results in advance. Might just as well be honest about it. Yes, New York offers many diversions. There is the waterfront, the ferry boats, the slips where the huge liners dock. I come down here a couple of times a week. I always try to be around when the Mary or the Elizabeth are coming in. 
Now, what's that Weehawken ferry doing a quarter mile off her course? Just sightseeing, I'll bet. Or her captain ought to have his confounded papers picked up. Shelby enjoys the ferry boats, all of them, but his favorite is the Staten Island Ferry. There's nothing quite like it in the world. Outward bound from the battery, there's the thrill of passing the Statue of Liberty. And coming back, Miss Liberty welcomes you home as the incredible skyline of lower Manhattan hangs shimmering in the haze, like the pleasure dome of Kublai Khan. Where else can a poor man get such an ocean voyage for a dime? Of course, 10 cents for one round trip does put the Staten Island Ferry in the luxury class. But during the rush hours, Shelby has discovered that he can board the Jersey Central Ferries across the Hudson and make three or four trips for the same dime without being noticed. This kills time and also furnishes amusement, for Shelby quietly enjoys criticizing the pilots who do not bring their vessels squarely into the slips. Among other things... Henry Shelby has become an expert on the management and conduct of New York Harbor. And uh, then there are the parades. New York City is the only place where there is a parade of some sort every day. That's one of the reasons Henry Shelby is happier here than he would be in any other city in the world. I just love band music. By last Armistice Day, I saw five different parades and even marched in one. I carried the front end of the bass drum and got $3 for doing it. So the patternless pattern of Henry Shelby's days and the days of perhaps thousands like him, men who choose to work only enough to maintain a bare thread of personal existence in a society that clamors for workers and rewards them with possessions and security and the same comfortable resting place each nightfall. Where does Henry Shelby sleep? A clean hotel bed is a a once-a-month extravagance to him. Perhaps he trudges to the Pennsylvania station and boards an 8th Avenue subway train at about 1 o'clock in the morning. That's why his cash minimum is 15 cents, the price of a subway token. He settles himself in the almost empty front car and drops off to sleep. He awakens before he reaches the end of the line, has a smoke, boards another train, and sleeps to the other end of the line. He has several standard trips mapped out, J Street to Queens, back to the Brooklyn end of the line, up to the tip of Manhattan, back to Penn Station. In five hours, he has probably netted four hours sleep. He has learned the habits of the transportation police, and he tries to keep himself from becoming too familiar a figure. That's why I use the subway maybe only every other night, or not quite that often. In warm weather, there are fire escapes, some of them covered, and Central Park and Prospect Park. And when it's really hot, there are the beaches. No one ever bothers you there. Always plenty of legitimate sleepers trying to beat the heat. When it rains and when the New York winter comes, there are other carefully cataloged places for shelter and a few hours sleep. Grand Central, Penn Station, the Port Authority bus terminal, hotel lobbies. There are rules of conduct for each, and Henry Shelby knows and observes them all. On rare occasions, he's questioned, but he always has the answers. Come on there, mister. Hmm? Come on, wake up, up, uh, up, up. Uh, oh, well, I certainly dozed off, didn't I, officer? You certainly did. You think this is a flop house? Of course not. It's very obviously Grand Central Terminal. That it is, and we don't allow bums to nap their ribs in here. Bums? I ought to resent that, officer. Well, resent it all you like. Seems to me I've seen you in here before. Well, that's quite possible. I take the two o'clock local for Poughkeepsie almost every night. I missed it tonight, so I'm waiting for the next train. Uh, six five, I believe it is. It is. Can you prove you're not a vag? A what? A vagrant. You got any money on you? Why, yes. Uh, let me see Six, seven, eight dollars. And here's my ticket to Poughkeepsie. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, you'd better get going, mister, or you'll miss your train. What? Yes, it's two minutes after six. Oh, I had no idea. I nearly overslept. That you did. Thank you so much for awakening me. Not at all. That's what I'm here for. Yes. Well, I must say you're right on the job. You bet I am. That's gate nine, mister, the Poughkeepsie local. Yes. Well, I don't want to miss it this time. No, you don't. (laughs) 
So, for the first time, Henry Shelby had to take the train for Poughkeepsie under the suspicious glare of the railroad cop. But the ticket was never punched, for he got off the train at 125th Street to begin another day of Manhattan meandering. Henry Shelby is never without three tickets. One to Poughkeepsie, one to Princeton, and the third to Elizabeth, New Jersey. His operating equipment for sleeping in the three major terminals. Why does this strangely bewildered, yet far from hopeless man, live apart from responsibility and the place he could so easily regain in working society? How many weeks, or months, or years will he continue to walk the streets of Manhattan? I don't know how long I'll live this life. I don't have much trouble. I've never gotten drunk and lain in a doorway all day. I've never been on a police blotter. I've never had to beg. Things seem so easy and natural, just as though they were supposed to be this way. I'm not going to look at the future. All I know now is that at 6 o'clock, I'm going to be at a little delicatessen up on Broadway where they serve a mighty fine boiled beef dinner for 68 cents. And I'd better get going. Takes me almost an hour to walk it. Why don't I take the subway? Why, subways are for sleeping. The CBS Radio Workshop is produced in Hollywood by William N. Robeson and was tonight directed by Mr. Robeson. Subways Are for Sleeping was based on the Harper's Magazine article by Edmund G. Love and was adapted for the workshop by Fran Van Hartisfeld. Henry Shelby was played by Byron Kane and the narrator was William Keneally. Also heard in the cast were Sarah Selby, Helene Burke, Edwin Bruce, Frank Gerstel, Court Falkenberg, Tony Barrett, Ted Bliss, and Alan Reed. The original score was composed and conducted by Fred Steiner. Next week, from New York, the workshop will present Only Johnny Knows, a survey of child training from the birds and the bees era of wonderful innocence a century ago to the complex and guilt era of today's psychiatric sophistication. Brilliant performance of the rarely played Symphony No. 6 in D minor by Jan Sibelius with Nils Erik Fugstad conducting the Sibelius Festival Orchestra is yours for the listening this Sunday when World Music Festivals comes your way on most of these same stations. Stay tuned for five minutes of CBS News to be followed over most of these same stations by My Son Jeep. America listens most to the CBS radio network.